daisy chains Can't seem to recall My true given name I see my footprints How they come, how they go Was that yesterday Or only a moment ago My heart is gone Welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 74. Ooh, 74. I know, I, I don't have the same like sort of flair that Dave does. But probably. you have you have the sultriness, so that's all that matters, you know. Did everybody hear that story? Did we talk about that story last time? I think we did because we announced your Twitter, but you know, it's probably good for, for anyone new. Well, here's the thing, because I really, I don't want people to think that I'm so conceited that I would create a handle for myself called sultry asian that is, that is a good point um so a, a person walked up to me at defcon uh or black hat and asked hey who's that who's that sultry asian you have on the podcast and i'm like well i, I have two asians on the podcast and ping or michelle no no i know ping so it must be michelle so i laughed about that and came back and started calling michelle the sultry asian which then nick took that name and made a twitter account yeah, thanks, Nick H. Yeah, and uh, basically um, uh, started tweeting as um, as Michelle, and eventually it got so popular that Michelle had to take it over because you really don't want Nick running Michelle's <laughs> Twitter account. It was guaranteed to not end up good for Michelle. Yeah, impersonating sultry Asian, and, and he is neither, well, I, I can't say, I can't speak to the sultry part, but he's definitely not Asian. No, no, he's definitely not Asian or sultry. <laughs> so yeah so and and, and that kind of actually brings up something interesting which we didn't talk about in the last podcast is um we just hired nick yeah we just hired him after that we hired him just because of what he did for that twitter account and threw him immediately into the fire yes yeah we hired nick literally the day he started he was on a plane across the country to handle a, a an incident response Yep, and he is there smelling like burning hair and fire retardant. <laughs> I think he's walking around in a tinfoil hat right now, but... Yeah, that, that that would not surprise me. That would not surprise me either. But that's just Nick, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we also hired our an, uh, a COO for our company. Yes. Yay! Yay! I know there should be massive applause in the background. I'm so happy. <laughs> we I don't have actually, any of the sound effects. Well, we don't have Dave. Well, Dave's not here. This is the problem, I know, guys. I know. You probably noticed by now, it's just Michelle and I. We're sorry, but I will tell you, there will be absolutely no Bruce Hornsby. Oh, so I, happy. Yeah, it's happiness. It's happiness. But yeah, yeah, so we don't have Dave. We don't have Ping. And it's really my fault. Uh, it's not their fault. So we're going to give them a break. I scheduled this podcast so last minute. That like I, last night. Yeah. Well, we don't have to go that far. Like saying it was <laughs> you know, just 10 minutes ago. But, you know, the point being is that they couldn't make it. They they don't love the podcast as much as Michelle loves it. Well, they're at least not a captive audience. That, okay. So, or that, or that. I was trying to make myself feel a little better and that you were here, <laughs> not just because you're being paid to be here, but I guess uh, kindness does not go with sultriness. So uh, no, those two <laughs> are in fact completely independent of each other. <laughs> that is true. That that is quite true. I don't know that from experience, but I'm just <laughs> saying. So what do we have going on? Well, we just yeah. came back from Derby, and um, Derby was pretty awesome, I'd say this year. Although uh, everyone's got con flu, thanks to um, Martin. Um, I guess he's patient zero, and everyone's sick. So we're we're all getting over that. As you can tell, my voice is still a little bit raspy. You actually sound better than you did yesterday, man. Yeah, I've, I've been drinking uh, a, a ton of water. So I actually reached out to, to Neil Fallon and said, hey, man, how do you keep your voice from going away? Because you, you have to sing every day. And he educated me on some things that seem like real common sense. So let, let me give you this common sense thing um, that never hit me until he said he told me. He says, everyone tells you to drink lemon water or to drink tea with honey or to use throat lozenges. He goes, but liquid never touches your vocal cords. The only thing that touches your vocal cords is air. And I'm like, well, that makes sense now that you say it. 
And he's like, so drinking liquid may soothe your throat, but it's not going to do anything for your vocal cords. So if your vocal cords are the things that are actually damaged, what you need is lots of water, because water helps produce the mucus and other things that are probably sound nasty to talk about that make your voice sound better. So I've been drinking like gallons of water a day. So medical tip from Neil Fallon, drink water for your voice, folks. A medical tip from Clutch. Can you believe that? Maybe if he ever stops playing in a band, he could he can become a doctor or something. At least your doctor. At least my doctor, yes. <laughs> ah, sorry. Funny <laughs> mental picture. Um, okay, so Derby. Derby was great. We hired, it's not really a polygrapher, it's not what you call them. But it was the polygraph challenge. Yes, and it was really organized this year. Um, we had, <laughs> yeah. You say that like it's an accomplishment. Well, it like was. You were organized. Well, this year. well, listen, last year, you know, we kind of just, we hired the guy. He came in, we threw a chair down, he set his stuff up, and we just took anyone who walked up. Uh, this year we had sign up sheets. Um, we had really good questions. We had a huge crowd. Uh, we had an organized event for what was going to happen in the end. So, like the second stage, like what, who would, how they would win the, the you know, the top two people. And we had a set number, you know, like that we could take. So it was, it was like 20 people. And we had a couple extras, like Dave sat in on one and, and, um, Nick sat in on one. And then we had these, uh, girls that were the booth next to us that wanted to try it. So we did that. But, you know, as far as contestants, we had 20 contestants. So and do you, is it okay to announce the winners? Do you have it the is. Name? It is. As a matter of fact, it's really okay. And I'll tell you why it's okay. So first, our first place winner was Aaron, Aaron Lesmeister. And then our second place was Leslie Carhart. Now, the reason it's really okay is when we were telling them at the end, um, we gave them both swag. They both got shirts and hoodies and stickers and everything we had at the table. Um, but we told Aaron he was going to get a free derby ticket for next year. And at the end, I realized that both of them did equally good. So I actually got two derby tickets. And Aaron's going to get one, and Leslie's going to get a, a free derby ticket. So if she's listening to this, when you get that email, it is not a fish. You really are getting a free derby ticket next year. So I hope that you enjoy that. So I guess the question is, do we have to be scared of these people? Like, does this mean that they were really, really good? Yeah, so we also, and this is another thing, we also really honed the rules this year and understood exactly what trying to cheat a polygraph would be. So our guy, Patrick, he's our polygraph guy. He says, if you're going to lie, we have two stages to it. You have a sheet with all the questions. And you have to answer the questions, yes or no, on the sheet. And then you get put in the chair and he asks you the same questions. And he says, if you're going to lie, lie on the sheet and lie in the chair. If you're going to tell the truth, tell the truth on the sheet and tell the truth in the chair. And then what he does is he tries to determine if you're being truthful or not. So um, people will have reactions to questions for multiple different reasons. You know, um, like one was really interesting. One of the questions is, have you ever parked in a handicapped parking spot? And the woman answered no, and she fluctuated, right, big. Like, And then he asked her at the end, she was like, I never did park, but I'm with my friends who drive, and they park in handicapped handicap spaces. So in essence, she was in the car when it was parked in ah. a handicapped space, right? And it picked up on that really, really interesting stuff. Now, so the, the key, th though, is that if you're going to lie, be consistent. Be consistent. And the the two people that tricked it, we definitely should be scared of because they lied on almost every question and the machine did not pick it up. Ooh, nice. So, they're winners. They're, they're winners. winners. Winners and a lying challenge. I don't know exactly how much you want to write home to your mom and tell her about that. But um, then we had a packed house for my speech. Actually, the room was so packed that they had to start kicking people out. And then after it was over, there were so many questions that we went and did lobby con and I held like a 40 minute extra session in the lobby where there was probably 20 or 30 extra people that came around to ask questions and talk about the topic at hand. So it was a really, really great time for those two events. Now your talk is available online, right? It is. Like Iron Geek is amazing. The guy got it recorded and got it up the same day. Nice. Yeah. I don't know how he does it that fast, but it's crazy. So let's just uh, let's just commit to having the URL to your live talk um, in the show notes. That's probably a good idea. 
Um, also got to hang out with Crystal Method a little bit. That was kind of cool. After their show, we went in the back and got to hang with them. They're really interesting folks, you know, really interesting uh, group of guys. So two guys. I there. love Crystal Method. They're one of my favorite groups of all time. They were so loud that like, roof tiles were falling off in the hotel. Nice. It was, they were unbelievably loud. Sounds about right, man. But they were really interesting, like, as far as their, like, their take on life and everything. Just real humble and appreciative guys for what they have. They were not arrogant jerks at all. Yeah, they were really cool just to hang out with and kind of, kind of chat. So, yeah, interesting meeting them and, and that. And, of course, uh, all the other stuff that happens at Derby. I, I got saved from being iced this year multiple times. <laughs> Deviant and uh, a couple of his buddies, uh, Dennis. Uh, got together and they created something called an ice medic, which was basically a giant set of PVC tubes that held a mass quantity of ice. And you poured your spurn off ice into it because they, because Dave bought a mobile oven. Um, so he was heating them up on the mobile oven. <laughs> and so they were boiling in essence. They were boiling ice, which you can't get much more disgusting things in your mouth in this planet besides boiling ice. Um, so you pour them into this ice medic and it comes out ice cold and then at least it's drinkable. I blame the lack of voice on Dave for being iced a few times. We can blame everything on Dave today. Mm. I mean, that's true. He's not here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we can blame everything on him. <clears throat> I think the weather is bad here and it's Dave's fault. Weather is bad here today. And I also blame Dave. Yeah. And the hurricane that's coming, that's Dave's fault. Totally Dave's fault. Yeah. If you miss your plane and our training next week, it's Dave's fault. Oh yeah, we've got training in Baltimore. By the time this uh, this podcast is out, we will have been there and back. Actually, it will be yes, yes. You are one hundred percent true. We will been there and back. So that class is over. Actually, it's full, so it wouldn't matter anyway. Uh, let's see what other events we have coming on. The very next one is Black Hat Amsterdam. I think there's like maybe a few seats left in there. We're maybe seventy, eighty percent full, but that's November tenth and eleventh over in Amsterdam. And that is our advanced OSINT class. That is our advanced OSINT thank you show, which, by the way, we had our first public training of the OSINT class at Derby, and it was amazing. I mean, really amazing. And we had a really great class, and we got some really good reviews from people saying it was exactly what they needed. Like, I just got emails this morning from a couple guys in the class that were saying they came back to their office, and they're actively using the things that we taught them in class to make their jobs better. Nice. Which is always a good feeling. Um, we're doing that same exact class, and not only in Amsterdam, but we're doing it also in Texas, Austin, Texas, in December 10th and 11th. So um, that class, it needs to have a certain number for us to continue with it. So if you're interested at all, please get in there and get to that class. Now, this changes everything. 2015 will end, and 2016, we have decided to make some changes to our training schedule. And, you know, I tell you, when you have a class like what's happening right now in Columbia, Baltimore, Maryland, it's really hard to make this choice because Baltimore, like, sold out. It's, like, full. But we decided next year we are going down to three public APSE classes and three OSINT classes. Because yeah, incidentally, we, this is not an SC scam. We're not pulling the whole scarcity thing. It's just literally bandwidth. It really is bandwidth. Right now, Michelle and I are the only trainers in the company, and it, we just travel. I mean, we don't see our families. So, you know, to save on marriages and avoid divorce, we are limiting. In January, I'm heading down to Florida for a couple months, and we are going to do a lot of training down there. We have an advanced practical social engineering course or APSE course, February 1 through 5. Then we're doing our advanced OSINT course, which is our two-day, February 16 through 17. And I wish we had a drum roll because Michelle and I finally have uh, launched the master's level, which I'm really excited about this. But I tell you, everyone's been emailing. I literally had a guy email me and list everything he's ever done everything he's ever done uh, in regards of SE. And he's like, I just want to take this course. And I'm like, you got to be a student. you got to be an APSC student. And he's like, no, but I'm a, I'm really a master. And I'm like, I'm sorry. And, <laughs> and then he's like, listen, would you let Kevin Mitnick take it? if he? And I'm like, he'd have to come to the APSE first. It's just the way it is, guys. You've got to be a student of our APSE course. 
and then you can come to this master's level course, and it is literally ridiculous. I don't know if there's anything in the world like it right now. I don't think there is because, again, we we really worked hard at making sure that everybody's going to get a hand at trying all of the aspects of SE attack vectors live with real people. And uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think anyone else can do or is offering what we're offering. I agree with that. So that's coming up right in the beginning of 2016, and then we're going to have one APSC class in Europe in the UK. And we're going to have one, hopefully, at Black Hat in Vegas. They accept us. Um, and then we'll have maybe one or two more OSINT classes throughout the year, uh, potentially one at Derby and potentially one somewhere else. Those dates are not on the website yet, so we will be getting them up there shortly. And then that will be our training schedule for 2016. 2016. Wow. Yeah. So this year was another big year for us because, Michelle, you and I debuted a book together. All about fishing. We did. And I'm getting a lot of really positive feedback on it. Also on Amazon, a lot of positive feedback. And we decided, you know, we talk so much about fishing that maybe one of the things we can do on the podcast is not just because we talk about it and it sounds like self-serving. So let's have someone who, on the podcast who literally has statistics about fishing that we don't have. We have a guy named Mark Chapman. We love this guy. Where he, he's uh, the developer and owner of, of a tool uh, that we use um, in, in our company. And he's able to collect millions and millions and millions of fish um, and the statistics behind them. And then we're going to discuss, in essence, what it means for us, what we can learn from this, and why fishing is still a problem for us, even despite we have all this amazing technology in the world today. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you, Chris? Really good. Really good, actually. Um, It's been a ridiculously busy week. Yeah, it's been quite busy, but uh, all good, though. The right kind of busy. Yeah, yeah, it is. A lot of things going on, which actually kind of fits our topic, because a lot of our busyness stems from, unfortunately, stems from breaches and things occurring, which a lot of them are occurring because of fishing. So in our market, a lot of times we hear people that want to focus on things like click ratio. So I know like one of the questions that will come in and we should really just openly discuss this is since you have millions and millions and millions of fish to analyze, um, do you have some sort of standard click ratio that you can spout off? Well, uh, Chris, uh, we've got, uh, like you said, we have a lot of analytics and things like that. But what we generally say is if, if you're measuring purely to the click ratio, you're probably measuring the wrong thing. Okay. Um, a lot of industries have this problem. If you want to measure programmers, like computer programmers, how many lines of code per hour that they write was a, was a metric. But does that really tell you the story about how eloquent and how good of a programmer there is? Or if you're a salesperson, how many phone calls did you make? I mean, that can be a predictive metric, but all that really counts for salespeople is can you close the business? From a fishing perspective, the click-through rate is, is a very compelling type of statistic because everybody can understand it. I don't care how untechnical you are. You can come in and, and describe what the click-through rate is. You know, we sent out 10,000 emails and 42% of the people clicked on them. There you go. But I really think that uh, the click-through ratio has to be, it, it's just one metric. Um, what do you do uh, out of the, uh, the 2015 Verizon data breach report says more than two-thirds of all cyber espionage and nation state related attacks start with a phishing attack, right? So that's a huge deal. Okay, so how does that relate to what the click-through rate is? Was it, it you know, it, the, the attackers get as many free chances as they want. So if you have a 1% click-through rate, fine, I have to send 40 times the emails, get 40% of the people to click, you know, that type of logic. So it, it's really uh, it, it's really a matter of making sure that you have the right context for the click-through rate. What about other attacks that don't involve a click at all? Our customers uh, are usually like to start with a send a mock spear phishing attack that has a link. But what about a test that has no link? And, and Chris, what, would you see any value as a social engineer to be able to send somebody an email that doesn't have a link? Yeah, I mean, this is like a philosophical conversation that you and, have had, you and I have had many times because we hear such a focus on click ratio. And I agree with you. It seems kind of um, biased. Like if I send you, 
um, a fish that has absolutely no interest to your corporate culture, and I get a 10% or 5% or 1% click ratio, and then the next month I send an email that has great interest, so I get a 90% click ratio, and then the following month I send another one that has no interest, and I go back down to 10%, that does not represent fail success ratios. That just represents I found out what you're interested in, and that's about it. Right, and, and, and so so in terms of the uh, click through ratio, that's one thing. What about the reply? How many people reply to email? Right. How many people would call a phone number? I'm not going to give you a link, Chris. I'm going to send you a, a, a fish. I'm going to have you call a phone number. Yeah. Or send me a text message back. I mean, there's so many other things that can be done. But if we do want to focus just on clicking, if we narrow the conversation down just to that, it still is pretty compelling to say, are all clicks created equal? So if I send you a fish and it's got a real high click-through rate, and usually the simpler the message, the higher the click-through rate, so a very simple one-liner saying your invoice is overdue, right, or something like that. I mean, that usually gets a lot more mileage than than more fancy, uh, highly formatted things. As you send that out there and somebody engages with it, sure, they click the link, but what happens after that? If you're worried about malware infections from links, well, of course, you want to reduce your the number of links that people click on. But from a social engineering perspective and from uh, people taking information out of your company, boy, if I can have you click on a link, uh, here's an example. If it's a budget time of year, which you can guess what that is for most organizations, um, you can go ahead and target all of the Department heads with a fish that says, hey, we have a new budgeting system. Please log into it and upload your budget spreadsheets. Okay? So, yes, the click-through rate or the engagement rate of 10% of the people or 20% or 30% is important. But somebody uploading, uh, interfacing and uploading their budget spreadsheets uh, leaks a lot more information than somebody who clicks on a link. Uh, you know, clicks on the link and then closes their browser, right? So the click-through rate, it depends on a lot of different factors, but how how much weight you put to the type of click and the type of actions people are doing, I think is much more important. And and I guess, you know, to clarify, we can understand why um, corporations who may be uneducated about it focus on click rate because that is, in essence, how the malicious guys may attack your company, right? They want you to click on a link and either open an attachment or input some credentials or download the malware, you know, whatever the action is that they want. But it starts with that phishing email. So we understand why corporations who may not be as um, educated on this fact will focus so much on click ratio uh, because, because of that reason. Um but those of us who are not the bad guys, like us sitting here in the podcast, um, our goal is not to just focus on that one action, but what it is that we can do to, to fix it. And so how we can help educate the population so they're not so susceptible to the attacks, whether it's the one line you're late on this invoice or it's the more targeted, you know, personalized branded spearfish. So, Mark, from your perspective, um, you know, clearly click ratio gives us a little bit of information about behaviors and about things that that people respond to. From your perspective, what would you say then are other things? Because click ratio is very concrete, right? It's very easy for people to understand and grasp on, and and people will see that as a way to indicate that they're improving or getting worse as time goes on. So so what else are are considerations for, for people? Well, I think that the most important thing is to make sure that the click-through rate is put in context. So just like if I'm driving a car and I've got the speedometer, if I tell you that I'm doing 70 miles an hour, well, what does that mean? Great, that's easy to measure, but is that 70 miles an hour in a school zone or 70 miles an hour on a racetrack? Right. right. So without having that context, it doesn't do you any good. I don't know whether I should, you know, be booing you because you're going too slow or whether we should be <laughs> taking away your driver's license. Right. Right. That's great. Right. Yeah. So, so, um, so for, uh, I'm a big fan of doing hypothesis based testing. Okay. So, uh, for example, if you're wondering, are people more likely to click on emails that are short and simple 
or ones that are fancy looking, right? So uh, we measure about 20 different factors and design is one of the factors. So is it a design level one or is it a design level three, a very highly designed uh, uh, email, right? So what do you do? You do an, a, an A-B test where you, you choose a randomly pick a certain you know, half of your uh, half of your target audience, and you send them the simple email with the design level one. You send the other half design level three. So when we do that test, the raw click through rate, whether it's seventeen percent, for you know whether it's seventeen percent or whether it's forty percent, right? That isn't as important as to see. Wait a second, we had a twenty percent click through rate for the simple design, and we only had a 10% for the complex design, okay? So the fact that it's 10 and 20% isn't as interesting as saying, hey, wait a second, let's put this in context. In our organization, we're twice as likely to click on something simple than something complex. And then the challenge is to say, what are we going to do about that? You know, are right. we going to take away your driver's license or are we going to boo you, right? So <laughs> what are we going to, what is it that we're going to do about it? When you start with a hypothesis, it may just be, hey, we want to have the story. Hey, everybody, we're twice as likely to click on simple links or, or um, simple messages versus complex. Uh, other examples, um, as you start looking at an organization, you might be able to see, if you look at some uh, cultural type changes in the United States, if you offer somebody, you know, you can win a free iPad or what have you, those click rates are higher than other parts of the world. Okay. I mean, significantly like more than 25% higher, right? But in America, if I get a, a funny email from my boss, you know, so Chris, you're my boss, right? You send me an email that says, Mark, do something stupid, whatever, right? Well, in America, I'm going to call you up and say, Chris, are you crazy? I'm not doing that. <laughs> in other parts of the world, it may be the case, and we can, we've measured this, uh, it may be the case that, uh, uh, boy, it would be a sign of dishonor to question authority. So I'm just going to quietly do the stupid thing Chris just asked me to do uh, without questioning it. Right. So as you mentioned, the whole idea of understanding culture and, and what compels people and what drives people's decision making becomes really important contextually on top of what they're clicking on or how often or frequently they're clicking. Oh, exactly. And, and I know your team, or you guys are the masters at voice fishing, right? Interactive, you know, having a real person calling people, right? But we we do automated voice fishing, which... I'm going to tell you, in America, boy, less than 6% of the people will even continue a conversation. Uh, an automated system calls you up and says, hello, this is the help desk. Press 1 so we can check your computer for viruses or whatever the premise is, right? But to, much to our surprise, in other parts of the world, we're seeing 16 to 26% where people will engage with an automated attendant and do it for extended periods, for multiple minutes, in terms of having to interact, like give us your zip code or give us your employee ID or whatever type of information. I mean, we had one test that we did worldwide, and uh, uh, we found that, well, I don't want to pick in any particular country, but <laughs> there's a, a particular country where 16.5% of the people went through a three and a half minute, 14 step automated uh, voice response, interactive automated vishing attack. Right. That's amazing. Then, I, I just wouldn't see that happening in the U.S. Me either. I'm, I'm like sitting here shaking my head, going, "What? Like what?" Oh, yeah. We we couldn't believe it either. In fact, we thought there was something wrong with the software, but there wasn't. You look at the logs, and they pressed with one. They did that, but then it's important to say what actions are you going to take based on that. So if I tell you it's sixteen percent or twenty percent or whatever, the reality is that there was a significant difference. So let's identify what those differences are. So go ahead and talk to the people and find out why is it that you clicked. And boy, it could be deep cultural things like um, you know, all of us sat at the dinner table with our parents in the seventies and eighties and nineties and the phone would ring as a telemarketer, right? So maybe we're programmed, you know, in certain parts of the world to just hang up and ignore automated messages. But whatever whatever the reason is, you just gotta say, hey, we're here to help affect behavior. Right. And if the behavior is to say, hey, in, in the parts of the world where you're not supposed to challenge authority, how do we give you a respectful and honorable way to question a request from authority? Or how do you handle things if you get an automated voice message? 
right? You know, automated phishing attack or what have you. But those are the kinds of things um, that, that are really important, but to have the context. And of course, click through rate or engagement rate uh, more generically. Like, did they pick up the phone? Did they interact? You know, things like that. But whatever the engagement rate is, that's critical to measure, but on its own, without context, it's pretty useless. And if you have a program, you know, an information security awareness program where you're trying to drive your click through rates down, We've measured this. What ends up happening is people uh, can get finely tuned to be able to recognize mock spear phishing tests. Okay, so depending on what you're doing, if you're not doing super highly variable attacks, right? But if you're sending the same email of a gerbil or whatever it is to a hundred thousand people or a million people, that's great. But eventually. What ends up happening is people get to recognize that particular attack. So you look and, hey, our mock spear phishing click-through rates are going down. Well, that's because you're doing an uninteresting test that doesn't reflect what the attackers are doing. So that really reminded me of uh, some client work that we've done in the past where clients are extremely restrictive about when, where, how, and who. You know, we, we can't test first thing Monday morning because X, Y, and Z, there's meetings at that time or there's lots of emails mm-hmm. and we don't want to do it on these particular days or at these particular times. And and the more sort of regimented and restricted you are, you know, the bad guys clearly aren't aren't making those same kinds of assumptions or, or they're not respecting those boundaries. And so so you're right. I think the challenge for pen testers and, and other security type services is this idea of how well can we emulate the bad guy through, through our actions, because what we what you found is just this idea that people are programmed to look for certain things or to look for them at certain times or to respond in certain ways. So I think that's that's a great and, and fascinating point, really. Right, and and the attackers have information. Okay, they have information um, about demographics and sociographics, and you can look at things different ways. So, uh, one of my favorite stories is a very large financial institution worldwide. They had a phishing program in place for a number of years, and the click through rate would be thirty percent one month, and twenty percent, and nineteen percent. Right, and it's just kind of luck of the draw based on the theme of the fish and based on design level, formality of the language. And, you know, you, we measure about 20 different things like that to be able to describe it. But at the end of the day, though, it wasn't an apples to apples comparison, right? But they challenged our team and they said, hey, you guys talk like, you know, you can pick a theme that everybody's going to click on, right? And, uh, and Chris and Michelle, I'm sure you guys get this all the time. Do something that will have a super high click-through rate. <laughs> well, this was a number of years ago, and this company is a huge financial institution. If you're an employee there, you're a number, not a name. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that's the corporate culture, right? So it was around 4th of July, and we sent out an email that said, hey, sign up for the company picnic, the 4th of July company picnic. We've got people in Singapore and Malaysia and all over the world signing up for this company picnic, over 80% of the people. Right, because as an attacker, we looked at it and said, "Hey, is there a personal need? And maybe the personal need is to feel wanted, right? Wow. So to be able to send that out there. So the lesson here isn't the eighty percent, right? That I mean, the click through rate being higher is what's important. But then, what do you do about that? So all of a sudden, when you talk about your security awareness training program, do you need to have honest discussions about? Hey guys, you know, are we really the kind of company to do that? No, there's better ways of handling it. And I don't want to give up how that was done, but you can imagine there's there's ways of doing it. But I think it's important to be able to say, hey, whatever you're doing for click rate or whatever engagement rate, you need to look at those facts and you need to put them in context, and then you need to be able to take action. And that action is not always training. Right. Uh, classic example. Um, Chris, you know how much information we grab out of out of office replies. A ton. <laughs> so six percent of your people were out of office over Christmas or whatever day, right? And I always wondered. I mean, our, our customers are saying that you know, usually the Monday after a holiday, their voice phishing, you know, or actual voice phishing attempts goes up. And you think, oh, well, why why could that be? Oh, yeah, because the prior week. We went ahead with the bad guys, not us, but, you know, the pr- prior week, the bad guys send out emails to a bunch of people in your organization. They reply, hi, I'm Mark. I'm out of office. If you're asking about project, secret project A, 
talk to Tim and here's his phone number. <laughs> if not, talk to my brother. I mean, ridiculous. He can almost do organizational mapping and things like that. It's, it's, and and I, I'm almost embarrassed to be talking to the social engineers about how to do this, but you guys, you guys get it, right? And Absolutely. But what is the control, though? Is the control you train people not to say as much and they're out of office? Or are there other things you can do? For example, can you look at the business and say, hey, which roles do not need to be able to have out of office outside of the organization or at least outside of their address book? And maybe there's a technical control you can put in place on your mail server to restrict it. There may be a training component for the people who do need to have out of office. You train them to be uh, ambiguous, right? Polite but ambiguous, right? Not to share information. And then the third thing, though, is, hey, wait a second. Well, Chris is out of the office. Who do I talk to? Oh, well, maybe you uh, you put on your SharePoint point or your internet portal, have an out-of-office portal. So if I'm an authorized employee, I can go to the internet, I can look, see Chris's out. Oh, I'm supposed to call Michelle about this project, right? And then the information is staying within your organization. What actions you take, what actions you're able to take as a result of your mock social engineering test, I think, uh, is where the real payment, uh, the real payback comes back. So, I mean, like, let's let's give some actionable things that the company should be looking for, right? So from your point of view, um, if we're saying click ratio is not that great and they need to have some scenario-based or hypothesis-based fish, then what is it that's going to help a company make an actionable change so that way they can see some results from an education program? There's actual ROI there. Right. Well, as it turns out, the the more you know about your organization, the better. Okay. So what we do is uh, we we group things into beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So at the beginner stage, and again, we're not criticizing the the sophistication of the organization itself, but in terms of your information security awareness program, if you're at the beginner stage, you've done some training, and maybe you want to do some benchmarking just to get some idea of what click through rates are, right? But then you very quickly just want to see, hey, how is this, what is the reaction? So you don't use click through rate to, as a management tool; you use click through rate to justify funding or what have you. When you get to the intermediate level, right, that's where hypothesis-based testing is the only way to go, right? So the planning process, it shouldn't feel like, hey, what would be something cool we can fish people on? Hey, here's a cool one. Hey, let's try that and see. I mean, that's fun to do, but the reality <laughs> is, what is it you're trying to accomplish? Okay, we want to know, are people more likely to respond in their native language or in English, Right. Now, the question is, what are you going to do about that, right? But it's one of those things where it may just be you'll share with people, hey, what we found is in XYZ country, unlike every other country, people were twice as likely to click if it was in the native language versus English, right? But you can take action and, and give some people some facts as a result of that in terms of basic education. As time goes on, though, you may be able to identify, uh, as you become more advanced, you'll be doing hypothesis-based testing that is really linked more to real-time type events. So all of a sudden, you're looking at what are real attacks that are happening in the wild, right? And I'm going to start with a hypothesis that we can train people not to click on that type of link. And whether it's something very specific, like the CFO that gets the email for a wire transfer request from the CEO, or whether it's something much more general, you know, uh, uh, department heads, can you upload your budget spreadsheets, right? But so you look at real attacks in the wild and real things that are happening both in your industry and, quite frankly, in your spam box, right? And then, and then, but what you want to do is say, hey, our hypothesis is that if we train people, it'll work. Right. Well, and so what do you do? You train half the people, you test everybody, and you see, I don't care if the click-through rate was 5% versus 10% or what have you. Wow, the people who took training were, I mean, we've seen cases where people have taken training and it's added confusion, where they actually did worse than people who didn't have training. Oh, wow. Right? Well, that would go back to the nature of training, not necessarily to training itself, right? Oh, absolutely. So for a concrete example, um, Back in the old days, we used to tell people to get rid of spam, click on the unsubscribe link, <laughs> right? Yeah, now Remember we use that, that in phishing. <laughs> 
Right. So now, so what do we do? We'll see. Hey, I want to see what kind of residue we have from that training we did 10 years ago, right? That have obsolete training. I wonder how much of that still stuck. So I'm going to send people an email like, uh, Oh, you've subscribed to a music service or what have you, but then we're going to have two links and you know, you got to make sure they're visually equal, but I want to subscribe or please unsubscribe. And then you get to see, you know, and you can measure, Hey, well, if certain percentage of the people unsubscribe, maybe that tells you something, but you got to get out and talk to the people. Why did you unsubscribe? Did you literally think this was a music streaming service and you wanted to unsubscribe or was it because of training? You know, so you got to look under the covers. You can't just do this from a distance. You have to get under the covers and figure out what is actually happening. And then you're able to affect change in your organization. Once you've affected change, though, that's where you come back and you redo your hypothesis-based test. So it's about objectively measuring it, the, the reduction in susceptibility to phishing and other social engineering attacks by taking concrete actions. Some of our best customers uh, actually measure the success of the program based on how many concrete actions they've been able to take to improve their information security profile. Are these sort of advanced customers still interested in click ratios, or are they like way beyond that and, and, and looking at sort of the qualitative factors? One of the things that Chris and I find is that our clients tend to become very sort of numbers focused. They, they need sort of quantitative and concrete ways that, that give an indication of improvement or, or de- degradation over time. So I'm, I'm just curious as to what your experience is in that respect. And let me add one thing to that, if I could. And I think part of the reason is not so much the, the guys in the trenches with us working, but they have to prove ROI. So they go to their company and they say, hey, it's going to cost X amount of money to run this program. And the bosses go, yeah, but what? You know, if I sell you a firewall, here's a big shiny box that you're plugging into your network. And that says, this is why we spent this money. But if I say, you know, phishing service, they go, well, but where's the big shiny box? So I need something. So like what Michelle said, with this quantifiable evidence of, of some kind of numbers shows that there has been a shift in some kind of attitude and actions that is positive. Do you find that to be the same case? Yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, you don't have just one. So raw click-through rate, fine. That's that's right. One, yeah, agree. One idea. Click-through rate within context, that's enough. Hey, we discovered, or we confirmed, or we found out. You know, so if you could say these are our discoveries, this is what we found out, and then this is what we did about them. Some customers prefer this to be more like a risk assessment where you have observation, observation, um, like an like an audit, like a risk-based audit. Observation, 6% of the people had out-of-office notifications and they disclosed 21 project names, 15, you know, that kind of statistics. What's the potential business impact? Then you describe how the sky is falling because they just gave away all that information to somebody who, you know, just got an out-of-office automated reply. Then you look at recommendation. Yeah, block out of office when you can, train people and have an out of office portal, right? So you look at, okay, well, how do we measure the success of that part of the program? It could be based on that. Other ways, uh, based on the number and quality of risk-based observations that you have and, and actual you know, management actions and changes that have been made. Other organizations are interested more in being able to show training, right? So if, it's, if you're coming from a pure training perspective, how do we we need our goal is to have sixty percent of the people take training, right? And then you want to test if the training's effective, right? So that gives you some A/B hypothesis based testing to see, yeah, well, yeah, eighty percent of your people took training, but hey, the twenty percent that didn't did better on a fishing test. Why is that, right? So, so there can be a discovery. The last thing that we do, which we think is really important, though, is what we call risk-based surveys. And a lot of organizations do this, but the whole idea is to say, hey, you know, we're not trying, this isn't a mock spear fishing test. This is just a risk-based survey where we go out there and we say, hey, do you use the same password at home that you do at work? Yes or no, right? Behind the scenes, there can be risk-based ratings for answers like that. Has anybody ever, ever asked you to share your password at work? Yes, no, I don't know. If you store things on the network drive, because our IT department is so great, it's safe to put it there. I strongly agree, Dom, to I strongly disagree, right? But by doing that, you're able to accurately measure perceptions, 
attitudes, awareness, you know, and they can be broken down based on, hey, what is your awareness of malware? What are your attitudes towards compliance? Specific questions, survey questions about particular information security policies. Does the organization have the right to monitor everything you do on our equipment? Yes, no, or I don't know. Right? And behind the scenes, a yes might be a five, and a, or I mean, what would be a one, and a no could be a five risk level, and a maybe could be a three risk level, right? But I mean, without getting into the math, that's another way. So, so as far as how the organizations measure, it's how many actions were we able to take? What is the real ROI? And this includes things like when we find that training isn't working, hey, spend that money on something else. And I'm not saying training in general, just so we're clear, Chris. But I'm just saying if a particular particular style of training doesn't work. Or maybe as you get more advanced, you find out, hey, these people don't respond to watching online videos, but they love in-person training, and that really affects their behavior. right? So maybe that helps you direct your dollars towards a different type of training or a different style of training. Yeah, like I agree, you know, to, to clarify my comment from before, I don't think that CBTs are necessarily bad. I just think that there's not one set style of training that always works. So um, people are too busy nowadays and people are getting 150, 200, 300 emails a day. And now if you say to them, your you know, punishment in essence for clicking, you have to watch this 10 minute video. We find, at least with our customers, it makes it more adversarial than it does. We're here to help you and make sure you don't do that again. And what can we do to help you succeed kind of thing? Yeah, Chris, you, you know, you know that you're spot on there. And what what I see happening, um, I mean, our the mock fishing industry, or what have you, that has really uh, overdone this teachable moment thing. Now we do teachable moment too. Everybody does, right? I send you a link, you click on it, you say, "Hey, you shouldn't have done that." Here, take some training. And we've measured this. And what? Well, I would say there's about eight percent of the people who I call saints, where if you tell them. You know, hey, I just duped you, but here, take some training so you won't be do it again. And they will take their time out, inwardly reflect, and take the training and be open to training and, and to be able to to read what's happening. You know, that happens a, a small percentage of the time is extremely effective. But then there's people like me, one of these type A personalities. And Chris, if you tell me that I'm duped, that might be the teachable moment, but I'm not in a teachable mood. <laughs> we know some people like that. What? Who? Who are you always talking about? I think everyone does. <laughs> Absolutely. So let me ask you a philosophical question. You've seen an increase in improvement in, in technological advances in business. We have now lots of companies doing security awareness training, including mock phishing. Why is it still a problem? Why is there still phishing working very simplistic to very complex working in breaches and actual real breaches? And we're not talking about mock phishing anymore. Why, why do you, and then again, I'm not looking, I know we might not have a direct answer, but it, you know, philosophically, why do you think it's still working? Well, phishing and social engineering is a lot older than computers, right? So, it's the kind of thing where I think people are looking at it like, I'm going to put a firewall in place, and the human firewall and things like that. And, and these are good things to add a layer of security. I mean, if you can increase, if you can reduce your susceptibility by 10% or 20%, hey, that's worth doing. So I'm a fan of, you know, there is no silver bullet that solves everything, right? And you should do things that can make a measurable improvement. But at the philosophical level, though, this is about people. This is about organizations. So you could easily get distraught and just say, hey, you know, I give up. People will always fall for scams, whether it's email or social media or whatever, you know. But there's a better way of looking at it. And you say, wait a second here. How can we help people recognize when they're at higher risk, either because of their role in the organization, either because of their employment status, uh, because of their lots of different reasons, right? You know, it's like, hey, I work as an engineer and I develop intellectual property for a pharmaceutical company. Yeah, well, why don't you train people how to put their antenna up, right? And B, and be able to see, hey, did you know that people would even be interested in what you do? Right? I mean, a lot of times you find that's the case where people don't know that they're a target. If you're walking around in public, you're touring, you're in a foreign country and you're touring, 
Do you do the fanny pack thing, Chris? For you? No. Do you really see me? Do you really see me with a with a fanny pack? He has a man purse. Yeah. I, I I don't have a purse. I don't. There's no purse. I don't use it. There's no pictures on the internet that can prove that. That's all I have to say. Oh, that's a challenge yeah. for the viewers. Find yeah. If you find a picture of me with a purse, you win a free book. <laughs> There you go. But but the, the whole idea is, hey, when you're in certain public spaces, maybe there's certain best practices, whether it's putting your money in your sock or whatever the physical right. things are, right? You're not going to completely prevent this from happening, just like antivirus doesn't stop all the antiviruses, or all the viruses, you know, things like that. So there's no 100%. So don't be discouraged about that. But it's a matter of you got to do something other than just saying, hey, we're just going to take a complete blind approach and just say, hey, we're going to send everybody the same fish and give everybody the same training and expect that to be able to cover the adaptive nature of the real attackers. So taking a risk-based approach, putting the focus where where you've got the most to lose, right, and be able to shore that up as much as you can. And that's really what it's about. So what are the, the, the trends that you see? Because like, if we look back, let's go like five, six, seven years, you know, 419 scams, and those type of things were quite prevalent and they worked, believe it or not. I know we want to laugh at that all the time, but they worked. And, you know, then we see this big push towards spear fishing and very targeted fish. Uh, are there any new trends that you see popping up now that people should be aware of this year coming up? Now we're entering a new year soon. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, e-commerce has been around for a long time. We all get that. But now the vast majority of invoicing, and that type of thing is done through email. I mean, I'm just putting that up. It was a great big change, right? So in terms of the, the style and nature of things, how hard is it for me to guess who's in your finance department? Not hard. And how hard is it to say, hey, you have an invoice that's overdue, right? So, so the ability to be able to say, I mean, 10 years ago, I have a what? An invoice? What do you mean? Invoice is something that goes to the mail room. You know, and then envelope and everything, right? So there's a, the, the change is that we are so used to, to doing things online and we're used to things coming from all different directions. You can't say, hey, the invoice is going to come from xyzcompany.com. No, it comes from their third-party service provider and things like that. So whether – I don't want to just emphasize invoicing, but the whole electronic, you know, the quotation process and everything that's done for commerce, um, it, it's done pretty – pretty loosely and using email for a lot of the things. So as a concrete example, for large uh, large company, we sent out an email. Um, it said, hey, your invoice uh, your invoice is overdue. Please uh, click this link to, uh, to whatever, arrange payment. Okay. Well, a certain number of people clicked on the link and that's your click-through rate. But when people clicked on the link, we just had to go to a 404 error page. Okay. So then we were interested in what else will they do, right? Well, a, a disproportionate percentage of people replied to the email, and the replies ranged from, hey, can you just send me a PDF copy of this invoice? Right? So you're asking somebody, to, asking an attacker to send you a, a PDF <laughs> file, right? Yeah. And, and and all the way to, here's our wire transfer information. Wow. I'm busy, right? You know, so you, you look at that kind of thing, that's pretty scary, you know, in terms of, it was so easy to do. Um, we've seen it, it, you know, the, the, it seems to be an uptick in the uh, example where the CFO gets an, it gets an email from the CEO asking him to wire some money, you know, that type of thing. But to me, it's, it's all about the money right now and the gaps in what people's expectations are. And the fact that a lot of people have their guard down when it comes to performing financial transactions through email or at least having them initiate through email. So even though it's not new, you're expecting to see more and more e-commerce attacks, e-commerce based phishing attacks on on consumers and businesses. Yes. So I was I was reading this report from the FBI. It was issued in August, and it talked about BEC scams, which is business email compromise scams. And just from January to August of this year, it was up like eight hundred percent. It was it was some crazy amount that it went up because. The nature of these are all phishing emails. So it's essence a phishing email and may be followed up by a phone call or in conjunction with a phone call where the whole goal is just to get someone's email compromised so they can look for 
wire transfer details or ACH details or bank details that were left in someone's sent folder. And when they find them, they can use that then to compromise their bank accounts or financial organizations. And, and it's not just limited to that, though, either, Chris. It, it also, um, we also have situations where uh, there's a lot of these uh, e-commerce sites. So it's like every, every company is making the other company become their data entry. So you need to log into our cloud-based service to invoice us or to submit a PO or to get your PO and things like that. And all of those credentials and everything, I mean, all the sites look different. I'm not saying that it, this is just the nature of it, right? But all the sites look different. And all of them have different passwords. So then you end up with situations where people are using the same password for for different portals. I don't want to name any <laughs> at this point, but you know, that that's the situation. So so it really is, you know, at this point it's if I can just do a money grab and I can do that through a little bit of email and get your credentials and wire some ultimately wire some money or get a fake PO or get some goods delivered, boy, that's even easier than you know, identity theft or other things that need to be, you know, where you have to take extra steps in order to, uh, in order to capitalize on, on the uh, activity. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, you know, it's, it's one of these things Like I know when I talk to people about it, sometimes they leave the conversation and they go, well, there's just no hope. Like there's no way to fix it. And although that's true, I, I don't feel that there's no hope, uh, but I agree with your sentiment before is that there's no way to say you're going to ever become 100% social engineer proof. You know, like there's some kind of stamp I can put on your company and you're going to never have a problem with any kind of breach ever again, because we, there's no way to do that with humans, right? There's no patch or tool or something you can put in that's going to hundred percent secure the human side of your, of your network. I guess, um, that's not really comforting a lot of times. What we'd like to do is just say, it's not always just look at it as no hope, but that the hope is in seeing that increase in the positive actions like what you talked about and as long as you can keep seeing the increase in those positive actions then you have some hope at least not being the next headline or in the news next because you got breached because of a phishing email or something to that effect yeah, yeah you're exactly right and certainly it is it is not a situation without hope but what we like to do is look at uh, look at the technology infrastructure side 20 years ago it would have sounded weird to Hack your own service, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it, just for the, for most companies, but name a company now that doesn't do vulnerability scanning on a regular basis. Yeah. And then when they first started doing vulnerability scanning, oh my gosh, we don't control the software from Microsoft or Apple or whoever wrote the software, right? We don't control that, so we just got to apply patches as much as we can. But oh, we can be discouraged, and it's not worth patching. No, you got it. It is worth patching. We we get that. But then when you look at what is the, how do you report that to the organization? Well, early on it was, oh, here's your list of known vulnerabilities, you know, 400 pages of issues. Now, and, and instead of click through rate, if you look at number of vulnerabilities, that was kind of the big deal. How many vulnerabilities did we have? 100,000 this month, 20,000 next month, 80,000 next month, right? If you're managing to that, that doesn't do it. But instead to say, hey, what is our average time to patch? Right? Do we have do we have procedures and processes in place to be able to react to these things? Right? And so in terms of the technical vulnerability assessment and management, yeah, there's no cure there either, but there are best practices. So an information security awareness program that has mock spear phishing and other it needs to have multiple components to it. But some of it that you're doing is just to try and say, to try to raise the bar. So you gotta know where where are we at. So let's find out where we are vulnerable. And just like with any other risk, some of the risk you need to accept, but then, hey, be smart about where you're going to invest and what changes you're going to make to to protect things that are most important to your organization. And by doing that, it ends up being a positive thing. But I think it's just a little bit too soon in terms of the most organizations being able to adapt uh, to that paradigm. So there's some of that fear, uncertainty, and doubt that, that we had back in the uh, early days of the web. Before I ask you this, I have one question we ask every podcast guest, um, and it does not have to be related to your industry. We just ask for a book you like, a book that you read that you'd recommend to our listeners. It doesn't even have to be security or tech related, but uh, people love, our listeners love to read. So we always ask our podcast guests for a book that they like. 
I could be a smart aleck and say, of course, uh, fishing dark waters. Like that <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I did not pay him to say that. I may or may yeah, not have paid him to I say that. I don't know how I feel that. about that, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you don't have to uh, do that, Mark. <laughs> we really want to know what you're reading. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but uh, other than that, um, one of the nicest uh, books that I just found intriguing, and maybe it's uh, the, the Geek in Me or something, but uh, The Martian is a very interesting book. But uh, We've been doing this since the beginning of our podcast, and Sometimes people refer to science fiction. Some people have tech books. Some people have magazines. And it was like, we just ask, and a lot of our listeners will go, oh, I never heard of that book. Let me go check it out, especially if they liked what you had to say. They may be like, oh, I like, you know, maybe we have similar likes in books. And people will always write in when I forget and go, you didn't ask that guy what his books were. So I've been making a practice to always ask. Now, um, before you came on, we talked a little bit about your company. And what it is that you do and how you have all these amazing statistics for, for fishing, uh, being that Fishline, um, which is your company, um, manages fishing programs for, for a large amount of people. So if people wanted to get in contact with you or they wanted to know a little more about some of the things you said today or what it is that you do, where can they go to, to find out about you and your company? The easiest place would be go to go to uh, uh, www.fishline.com. That's p h i s h line.com, and uh, that, that's a great way of uh, of looking us up online. And there we have a Twitter feed, another uh, LinkedIn, and everything else. But the website would be a great spot to start. That was my next question, and you answered it. So people are always like, "Oh, does this guy have a Twitter feed or something?" So it's all on the website there, fishline.com, and uh, that's where they can find out about you and your team. Mark, phenomenal. I mean, this is really interesting. It's uh, a topic that I don't think as an industry we talk about enough, uh, which is fishing and and um, and also how to do it right. These tests, how to do it right. So really fascinating uh, to be able to spend some time talking to you about that. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure. Well, another good one, Michelle. Yes, Mark is awesome. Such a nice guy. And we really didn't pay him to to like you know, <laughs> mention our book. I mean, I actually felt a little bad when he said that. I thought, oh, I hope he didn't feel like he had to do that because <laughs> that would be terrible. I know it's always uh, a hard one when people know you wrote a book and they don't mention it. They always feel like they should, and it's like, no, no, it's all good. It's all good. I mean, sometimes people ask me like, hey, you remember that story you wrote in chapter five? And I'm like, I got no clue. I didn't read my own book, so. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about it, what, you know. <laughs> but a really good one. I really feel like it is something that needs to be discussed more in this industry, um, especially how to pull out good metrics for our for our people and for our companies that we're working with. Yeah, I thought the discussion about the emphasis on click ratios was great and timely because that is something that people tend to get really just sort of narrowly focused on. Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many companies. I mean, you know this. You work. We work together, but the companies that will come to us and they don't know how to even think outside click ratio because that's all they've been taught. And, and, you know, and, and coming in from, from the human side, trying to be understanding because I get it, you know, this is the way the bad guys do their thing. So you focus on click ratio because if we don't click, we're not bad. Right. And that of course makes people want to focus on just click ratio. So, yeah. But the moral of the story is the guy who does the fishing tool says that that it's so about so much more than just fishing and it's so much more than just click ratios. Yeah. I mean, he really talked about a holistic approach to security. And I think that's a, a great point for everybody to take away. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great, great podcast. Okay. So you want to keep up with us. It is uh SOC engineer Inc for the corporate human hacker, which is our dot org. Um, of course you have Michelle at sultry Asian. Uh, on Twitter. <laughs> These are all Twitter. You can follow us there. Uh, our website is www.social-engineer.org and social-engineer.com. Um, if you're still on IRC, which believe it or not, there's been some activity on there recently. We've been having some interesting conversations late into the evenings. It is uh, the free node network on channel social-engineer. That's um, irc.freenode.net in case you are interested. If not, and you like the outro music, you definitely got to check out the band Clutch. They just dropped a new album today. Uh, it's pretty awesome. And um, if you like the uh, outro music, you can check that song out, Gone Cold. Okay, I think that's about it. Until next Until time. Until next time. And maybe we'll even have more people with us. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> See ya.
chains Can't seem to recall any given name I see the footprints How they come, how they go Was that only a moment or many years ago? My heart is gone 